The holiday is over. It's time to dust off your pencil case and warm up the interactive whiteboard and get ready for the new term. As you return to the classroom at the beginning of term, energy levels will be high, having enjoyed a break, a few late mornings and a few late nights actually having a life. It's great to feel re-energised and ready to face the new academic year and the challenges that lie ahead. Hi everyone, I'm Natalie from My Progression and this video will take you through the 10 top tips to surviving your first term. This video is for anyone just starting out in a new role, new school or first ever term in education. But we don't just want you to survive, we want you to thrive. I'm going to run through the 10 tips to getting the most out of your first term. Now some of these you might already know or even do, but some might surprise you. We do have quite a few videos that will expand on some of the guidance, so look out for the video icon and see the link in the description below. Number one, make connections. Whatever your role in school, it's essential to form good relationships and find your place in the team. Being the newbie can be hard, but it's so important to put yourself out there and make an effort to get to know the people you're working with. Now, you should be introduced on your first day, but there may be people you haven't met yet. So introduce yourself at the first appropriate opportunity. So this could be in the staff room or on lunch duty. Be friendly, offer a smile, and be open to help and accept help. If you're an ECT or NQT, build on the relationship with your mentor. Your mentor's role is to ensure that you succeed and they should be motivated to guide and advise you. Make sure you're easy to mentor and you take feedback well. It's a two-way relationship, so don't be scared to approach and ask for help or just get some feedback on your progress. Number two, plan ahead. If this is your first year in teaching, it's often this first year that a lot of the groundwork is done that can set you up for years to come. As you create resources or letters to parents or homework sheets, keep a template copy, set up an organised filing system on your computer and name the documents clearly so next year when you want to find the letter about the year four trip to the farm, it's there for you to tweak. Or that self-made sheet on adverbial phrases for year seven can be pulled up and edited and reused. I don't know about you, but I love a to-do list. Clearly set out all the tasks you need to complete and when. However you create one is completely up to you. There are some really good teacher planners out there or you can use your computer, tablet or phone. Now I use my Outlook calendar and block certain times out with the task I need to complete. It's really helpful because I get a reminder too. Plan your PPA time to be as effective as possible. Some schools allow PPA time to be taken at home and some would rather staff be on site. There are pros and cons to both, but the main thing is just use that time efficiently. It's too easy to get into conversations with colleagues and before you know it, an hour of your time is gone. And once it's gone, you don't get it back. Think about how and where you can do your planning and make sure you stick to the task at hand. Number three, set your standard from day one. We all know that your class will run better with structure and clear guidelines for behaviour. So set it out from day one. You must be consistent with the rules you put in place for your classroom. If you adapt any of these rules, it could be seen as favouritism or that you don't stick to what you said. And this could cause a decline in behaviour. In primary, it's really useful to have the class put together a list of rules or a charter because they then have helped come up with the rules they're more likely to hold themselves and each other accountable. In secondary, setting the tone early on is a great way to show your class who you are and what they can expect from you. Setting your rules on homework deadlines and how to answer in class will help keep things clear and allow you to avoid too much disruption. Now let's say your desired standard is up here. If you let the class get away with dropping your standard or you set your standard of behaviour too low at the beginning, then you have a more challenging job to get them back up to where you need them to be. Whereas if you set it where you want it from day one, if you see it dropping at any time, you don't have far to go to get it back on track. Number four, be strict with your workload at home. It goes without saying that most teachers will have to take their work home. However, be strict with your time. Start as you mean to go on. 
Think about what is reasonable. Talk to colleagues and how do they manage their workloads. Set clear rules and boundaries or you'll burn out. Think about what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do. Like lunch might be sacred as you need some time to decompress, but an hour after work in the evening is okay for you. Or you could be okay eating your pot noodle and getting some marking done during your lunch time. Just find out what works for you. Do your best to leave work at a reasonable time throughout the week. You don't have to be the last person left in the school that the caretaker is throwing out at the end of each day. Sometimes it's better to just go. You'll probably be able to work quicker and more effectively after a break anyway. If there's anything pressing, then go in 15 minutes earlier the next day so you'll have fresh eyes and be in a better frame of mind to get it done. One of our contributors told me that when she had to do work over the weekend at home, she'd get up on a Saturday at 6am and work till 10. And whatever wasn't done, wasn't done. Computer off and she got on with her weekend. Do what works for you, but find a routine and make sure you have that well-deserved break. We hear the words work-life balance a lot, but they are essential and we need to take responsibility and aim to create that balance. If we don't create the balance, it will certainly have a negative impact on our lives, our health, mental health, and also our relationships. Number five, don't overcommit. Think before you say yes and learn to say no. It's so, so easy to be pulled into extracurricular activities in a school, but think carefully in your first term especially, of what you say yes to. When someone finds out that you're a good guitarist, before you know it, you'll be running a lunchtime guitar club, putting on a concert, and playing at the head teacher's birthday party. Focus on getting the teaching right for this first half of term or term, and then tentatively dip your toe in the world of chess club or dance club, or coaching a sport of your choice. Because that overcommitment can be a challenge and then you have an impact on many areas of your work-life balance. Number six, prioritise. Focus on your teaching what's required of you and do it well. You train to be a teacher, so focus on this skill initially. You may have many strings to your bow, but get the main one right and you can add on later. Get to know your classes, the curriculum. Focus on your teaching and the children's learning. Gain confidence as a teacher. Use your observations and feedback to evaluate how you can improve and what could be done better. But also, give yourself a pat on the back for the things that you are doing well. Number seven, ask for help when you need it. Don't be a martyr. Please never struggle. If you're an ECT or NQT, those first few weeks can be overwhelming in so many ways. You're suddenly it. You're the teacher and there is no one there to work with. As a student, it's easy to get used to having the class teacher around to pick up some of the issues, which is great. But now, you're in charge. The crutch of another adult who knows the children has gone. But remember, you'll likely have an excellent teaching assistant who can help, support, and also advise you. Again, go back to building on teamwork and good relationships, and you should never feel isolated and overwhelmed. Ask someone on your team for advice or help. If that fails, go to your mentor. Sometimes it's presumed you may know things, and you just don't. If you don't know the procedure at lunchtime, ask. If someone asks you to go and make copies, don't just wander around the hallway trying to find the copier. Ask someone to help you. It's okay not to know everything when you're new. Number eight, look after your health and your mental health. I mentioned before about striving to create work-life balance, but we also need to look after our physical health and mental health. We all know it's so easy to pick up various illnesses when working with children and it's difficult to avoid. You know that you'll get that sickness bug when six of your class have been sent home that week or that sore throat when everyone is coughing and sneezing in your class. The past three years have taught us a lot and I would still endorse that hand gel and having some antibacterial wipes in your drawer. Make sure you eat well too. Whilst I'm not a doctor and do enjoy a Big Mac every now and then, getting your five a day is really important. Take those multivitamins, eat that hearty soup and piece of fruit, and keep your immune system in good order. If you are unwell, make a decision and address whether you're well enough to go in and teach effectively. If you aren't well enough, a day in bed or the trip to the GP may be what's needed. Think about who you could be passing your germs to. Are any of your children vulnerable with a health condition? Or are any of your pupils going home to vulnerable adults, a parent who may be in treatment? 
You may feel guilty when you take time off, but please consider the bigger picture. Many education authorities promote access to the seasonal flu jab, and although it's a personal decision, it's well worth considering. Nothing worse than a dose of flu to lay you up for a week. Mental health is as important as physical health, but sometimes much harder to assess yourself and for others to identify. If you feel overwhelmed, anxious or stressed, please talk to someone. Approach a colleague you trust or speak to your mentor. Have a look and see what you can do to relieve some of the stress. Wellbeing has been high profile in schools for a significant time now, and your school may have a wellbeing lead. Seek them out as they're not just there for the children, but for staff too. Talk to others and pick up tips to ensure you are looking after yourself. Talk and ask others how they're doing and be honest if you're struggling. And you may be surprised by the support or advice you get or even show your support to someone who you know is overwhelmed. Number nine, treat yourself. We all love a treat, don't we? Reward yourself at the weekend or even a night during the week. Treat yourself to that glass of wine on a Friday. Take that long bath with your lush bath bomb that you've been saving, or go for that coffee and catch up with a friend. Reward yourself for the hard work that you're putting in. Number 10, reflect. And finally, as the term goes on, reflect how far you've come. Those nerves almost paralyzed you in your first week have now dissipated. You feel more confident in your lesson planning. It might be worth keeping a diary or journaling your experiences. You'll be surprised at how quickly your confidence grows and it'd be nice to look back at your journey. Reflect on the good lessons and the not so good lessons to help you stay at the top of your game. Tweak your practice as you go and don't forget to check in with your mentor. We would love to hear any of your top tips for surviving your first term in the comments. And we wish you all the very best as you begin this term. I've been Natalie, and if you found this video on surviving your first term useful, then check out the link videos in the description below. Like, subscribe, and click on the bell to keep seeing more from my progression. And let's keep your career in motion.